Hello students, I'm Jan and this is the introduction to the sandboxing module of Pwn College. Uh, in this module we'll talk about uh, the concept of sandboxing, uh, the technologies used in sandboxing, and um, the ways to break out of at least kind of rudimentary sandboxes. So let's talk about sandboxing. What, what do we mean by this? Um, well, there's a relevant XKCD as there is for a lot of things um, about the sandboxing cycle. Essentially, as we develop new technology that can be um, put together in cool ways to enable cool functionality, we start slowly realizing that the way that we have put this technology together is uh, not very secure, causes a lot of vulnerabilities, etc. And this happens time and time again with different technologies. And then we end up figuring out other ways to either separate them or to um, sandbox, essentially to uh, make uh, reduce the ability of these vulnerabilities to uh, harm us um, in these systems. All right, let's let's uh, remind, rewind back to the beginning. We're just going to do a decade by decade jump. These decades are very approximate. It's uh, just a good frame. Don't don't take this as um, kind of verbatim um, the history of computing. Um, but let's go through and um, look at how um, kind of sandboxing arose from the beginning um, or close to the beginning, uh, which is computers back in let's say the 1950s. Right, these computers. You often um, wrote programs with say, punch cards, and when you loaded these programs into the computer, they would just run in the like bare metal of the computer, just as close to the hardware. That was the only thing the computer was doing was executing your program. The problem was was uh, there were multiple problems. One is it could execute only one program at a time, and two, um, you could. Um, the, the the programs uh, could do stuff like damage the hardware and so forth. They uh, they, they they could do anything on the machine, um, and certain things had side effects that could be dangerous. And so um, the um, split of kind of an operating system and a user space arose, which uh, did two things. They enabled um, a bit more protection. So a, a typical process running in your machine couldn't destroy it. And two, they allowed multiple processes to run at the same time. So we slowly started developing multi-processed systems um, where every process could um, um, run uh, as long as it carefully avoided uh, clobbering other processes, right? And very early uh, prototypes, you could you know, have one process in one part of the memory space, another process in another part of the memory space, and they would happily um, use their own parts of that memory space to avoid clobbering each other. Uh, the problem is that they could clobber each other um, if they, people weren't careful. And so we created um, essentially a sort of sandboxing where we separated these processes into their own memory spaces. We created virtual memory. Nowadays, um, most computers you interact with will have virtual memory support where multiple processes will have their own view of memory um, so they don't clobber each other. Uh, and then other um, uh, kind of isolation and sandboxing measures um, start arising. Uh, let's say in the 90s, again, this is kind of a um, approximating frame. In the 90s, you see the creation of uh, scripting languages. Um, and uh, scripting languages have an implicit separation between the interpreter and the um, interpreted um, um, thing, right? The interpreted code. Um, and the interpreter uh, has, you know, low level uh, operations that it does and so forth. The interpreter code just calls into the interpreter. It's a sort of isolation that is not meant to be a security isolation, but is often actually utilized as such. There are plenty of um, online uh, services that will give you like a Python shell to play around with. And every once in a while, because of faulty isolation between Python, the interpreted language, and Python, the interpreter, uh, security vulnerabilities arise. And there are some uh, famous examples of this, for example, on uh, Microsoft's Rise for Fun uh, platform, which allowed you to interact directly with Python uh, within that platform, but that functionality had to be taken down for a while, specifically because of security issues. Um, let's look at a specific case of this. Um, to motivate this module, 
and that is web browsers. Web browsers are probably the biggest example of all potential functionality being stuffed into one program um, to keep up with the needs of a rapidly expanding web. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, uh, we saw the rise of um, you know YouTube, the rise of even earlier than that other uh, video sharing and 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 uh, game sharing or you know game um, creation platforms, um, a lot of rich web content, and this was powered by things such as Adobe Flash, ActiveX, Java applets, um, these uh, sort of technologies that all ran in your browser with the full permissions of um, the user you were running them on as the full uh, privileges um, to do, um, to enable rich content on the web. Um, what ended up happening was kind of the wild west uh, of, of security. You had new vulnerabilities constantly being discovered and the exploitation of these vulnerabilities would give an attacker essentially full control of your system as if they were acting as your user. This happened constantly with Flash, constantly with Java, constantly with ActiveX, and uh, it, it led to this huge explosion in drive-by downloads for a while. Um, they were the biggest threat on the internet. You would accidentally click a malicious link, it would load an ActiveX um, uh, control that would uh, have a vulnerability and then you it'd be over your machine is infected um, so uh, initial mitigations w in, into this was trying to eliminate um, vulnerable software reduce the attack surface uh, patch bugs of course um, Adobe flash uh, for example didn't survive this um, this sort of mitigation it, it, it was killed off in for many reasons. In, part of them is the security um, uh, posture of, of that uh, system. ActiveX was eliminated. Java applets are not something you see on the internet nowadays. Again, not just because of security, but but also in part because of security. Um, nowadays, most Java applets you see are legacy systems that some companies might use internally. Then they would actually go through a lot of, jump through a lot of hoops to actually make them work in a, in a reasonable browser. Um, uh, but this didn't solve the problems, right? As we removed these uh, attack surfaces, hackers moved on to other areas. Um, in order to eliminate uh, Flash and so forth, we had to create very performant, very high powered JavaScript um, engines that, that could um, do a lot of this dynamic content uh, functionality that, that we were eliminating. Um, this uh, caused uh, these vulnerabilities, these uh, JavaScript engines to be very complex with more vulnerabilities. Um, every uh, functionality of your browser represents some potential surface that could have a vulnerability. The uh, GIF uh, parsing library, um, the various media codecs that your browser uses. All of these are potentially vulnerable and, and, and there are examples of them being actually vulnerable and this causing uh, the same problem as before. The exact same problem is when you would exploit Adobe Flash occurs when you exploit a vulnerability in your JavaScript just-in-time compiler. And so this led, and now this is uh, you know very recent history to the rise of um, sandboxing in the browser, right? Um, the idea being that any um, code data, and as a reminder, code and data are roughly the same thing, um, but they any code and data that you don't trust should uh, run with basically zero privileges, right? Um, the way that this is generally accomplished, you have a um, process, let's say on a modern browser, you have a parent process that is responsible for interacting with your system and has the privileges to do so. But then every single um, individual page and individual plugin and individual extension, they all run in their own processes with no privileges, right? Um, if uh, a pro if a, one of these individual child sandboxed child processes needs to uh, do something, you know, to the system, store a cookie, display some uh, content, something along these lines, it'll ask the parent process to do it that on its behalf. Um, 
this is the ideal model. It's not always how things work for performance reasons. Oftentimes these child processes have to talk to the system at large and so forth. Um, but this is the ideal sandbox scenario. And in this module, we will learn how different sandboxes work. We'll keep things simple. Um, this isn't a, uh, you know, sandbox design um, course. This is a, a, a cybersecurity overview course. We will look at simple sandboxes for the most part, but also um, some modern sandboxing techniques. <clears throat> Finally, a note on uh, sandbox effectiveness, right? Uh, we talk a lot about sandboxing, what it is, how it arose. Does it work? Um, yes, it works a lot. Throughout this course, we'll look at several mitigations that are extremely strong. A strong mitigation is something that um, for the vulnerability class that it is designed to mitigate against, um, essentially raises the bar significantly. Sandboxing does this. Uh, whereas in the early 2000s, you needed one vulnerability, code execution in Adobe Flash to um, rampage across a victim's computer. Nowadays, you need more. You need more vulnerability in your JavaScript just-in-time compiler and a vulnerability in the sandbox or the kernel or something um, around that um, um, the, the vulnerable uh, process. So you first get a foothold inside the sandbox and then you have to escape that sandbox. And in this module, that's what we will be looking at how to do for very simple sandboxes. See you later in future videos.